conversation on the way. The final type of conversation, akin to listening, is a form of mutual exploration. It requires true reciprocity on the part of those listening and speaking. It allows all participants to express and organize their thoughts. A conversation of mutual exploration has a topic, generally complex, of genuine interest to the participants. Everyone participating is trying to solve a problem instead of insisting on the a priori validity of their own positions. All are acting on the premise that they have something to learn. This kind of conversation constitutes active philosophy, the highest form of thought, and the best preparation for proper living. The people involved in such a conversation must be discussing ideas they genuinely use to structure their perceptions and guide their actions and words. They must be existentially involved with their philosophy. That is, they must be living it, not merely believing or understanding it. They also must have inverted, at least temporarily, the typical human preference for order over chaos. And I don't mean the chaos typical of mindless antisocial rebellion. Other conversational types, except for the listening type, all attempt to buttress some existing order. The conversation of mutual exploration, by contrast, requires people who have decided that the unknown makes a better friend than the known. You already know what you know, after all, and unless your life is perfect, what you know is not enough. You remain threatened by disease and self-deception and unhappiness and malevolence and betrayal and corruption and pain and limitation. You are subject to all these things in the final analysis because you are just too ignorant to protect yourself. If you just knew enough, you could be healthier and more honest. You would suffer less. You could recognize, resist, and even triumph over malevolence and evil. You would neither betray a friend nor deal falsely and deceitfully in business, politics, or love. However, your current knowledge has neither made you perfect nor kept you safe. So it is insufficient by definition, radically, fatally insufficient. You must accept this before you can converse philosophically instead of convincing, oppressing, dominating, or even amusing. You must accept this before you can tolerate a conversation where the word that eternally mediates between order and chaos is operating, psychologically speaking. To have this kind of conversation, it is necessary to respect the personal experience of your conversational partners. You must assume that they have reached careful, thoughtful, genuine conclusions, and perhaps they must have done the work that justifies this assumption. You must believe that if they shared their conclusions with you, you could bypass at least some of the pain of personally learning the same things, as learning from experience of others can be quicker and much less dangerous. You must meditate, too, instead of strategizing towards victory. If you fail or refuse to do so, then you merely and automatically repeat what you already believe, seeking its validation and insisting on its rightness. But if you are meditating as you converse, then you listen to the other person and say the new and original things that can rise from deep within of their own accord. It's as if you are listening to yourself during such a conversation just as you are listening to the other person. You are describing how you are responding to the new information imparted by the speaker. You are reporting what that information has done to you, what new things it made appear within you how it has changed your presuppositions, how it has made you think of new questions. You tell the speaker these things directly. Then they have the same effect on him. In this manner, you both move towards somewhere newer and broader and better. You both change as you let your old presuppositions die, as you shed your skins and emerge renewed. A conversation such as this is the one where it is the desire for truth itself on the part of both participants that is truly listening and speaking. That's why it's engaging, vital, interesting, and meaningful. That sense of meaning is a signal from the deep, ancient parts of your being. You're where you should be, with one foot in order and the other tentatively extended into chaos and the unknown. You're immersed in the Tao, following the great way of life. There you're stable enough to be secure, but flexible enough to transform. There you're allowing new information to inform you, to permeate your stability, to repair and improve its structure and expand its domain. There the constituent elements of your being can find their more elegant formation. A conversation like that places you in the same place that listening to great music places you, and for much the same reason.
A conversation like that puts you in a realm where souls connect, and that's a real place. It leaves you thinking, that was really worthwhile. We really got to know each other. The masks came off and the searchers were revealed. So listen. Listen to yourself and to those with whom you are speaking. Your wisdom then consists not of the knowledge you already have, but the continual search for knowledge, which is the highest form of wisdom. It is for this reason that the priestess of the Delphic Oracle in ancient Greece spoke most highly of Socrates, who always sought the truth. She described him as the wisest living man because he knew that what he knew was nothing. Assume that the person you are listening to might know something you don't.